Boudicca was an ancient Celtic warrior queen who led an army in a rebellion against the Roman Empire. The story of this brave woman's life has often been reduced to just a few sentences in a textbook. And that's because there's very little known about her life. There were just two Roman historians, Tacitus and Cassius Dio, who wrote down information about Boudicca. So everything we know about her, it's rather skewed from the enemy's perspective, and both of their versions of the story vary slightly from the other. But even from this biased standpoint, we can still see her bravery and her determination to protect her people. Despite the fact that we know so little about her life, she still has made a massive impact, and she very nearly defeated one of the largest empires in the world. She is still remembered to this day as being an epic hero in British history. The term Celt is used to refer to the ancient people of the United Kingdom, but it covers the Gaels, Britons, and Gauls, just to name a few. There were dozens of different independent tribes that were certainly not united. So while their lifestyles were often very similar, they each had their own customs, languages, and traditions. So the name Celt is just a way for historians to refer to this ancient society. The Celts did not keep their own written records, so much of what we know from them comes from Roman records and archaeological digs. According to the Romans, Celtic warriors often fought naked, or at least with their shirts off. Their bodies and faces they were painted with intricate designs, which earned them the nickname Picts, which meant the painted people. They were known for being incredibly brutal, and during battle they would begin grunting like animals and blew loud horns to startle their enemies. They beheaded the Romans without hesitation because they apparently believed that a man's head contains his power and his soul. Despite their barbaric war strategy, these were also very intelligent people. They were the first society to invent chainmail, which protected them from enemy swords. Both men and women wore gold necklaces that included intricate designs. Paved roads were also a Celtic invention, even though the Romans later tried to claim that they came up with the idea first. So in a lot of ways, the Celts were far from being the bumbling brutes that they're often made out to be. Boudicca was the queen and wife of King Prasutagus, and they were rulers of the Iceni tribe. They were located in modern-day Norfolk and Suffolk, and for a while their people they lived in peace. A Roman statesman and historian named Cassius Dio describes Boudicca as such. In stature, she was very tall, in appearance most terrifying, in the glance of her eye most fierce, and her voice was harsh. A great mass of the tawniest hair fell to her hips, around her neck was a large golden necklace, and she wore a tunic of divers' colors over which a thick mantle was fastened with a brooch. While Boudicca apparently lacked in grace and beauty, she made up for with brilliance. According to Dio's backhanded compliments, she possessed of greater intelligence than often belongs to women. In Celtic society, druids were intellectuals who held very highly respected positions in their respective tribes. They were like priests who performed the pagan rituals, but they also practiced medicine, alchemy, science, and philosophy. And yes, druids could be women too. Since Boudicca is remembered for being very smart, it would make sense that she may have been a druid in her spare time, apart from being queen. This would have only made her a more well-respected leader. But with the new threat of Roman invasion, Boudicca would need to focus on protecting her people more than ever before. The Romans conquered southern England in 43 AD. King Prastagus could see that his Celtic warriors were no match for the Roman legion, so he ordered his warriors to stop their rebellion. Prastagus agreed to align with the Roman Empire for the sake of protecting what remained of his people. He promised that when he died, his tribe would be under Roman rule. In his last will and testament, he left his land to his two daughters and to the Emperor of Rome. The king truly did believe that they had made a peaceful negotiation, and the Romans even lent to Britain their currency and helped them to to integrate into their new society. They were given 40 million cestuses, but they were expected to pay it back over time, plus interest. There is a debate over how much one cestuary would actually be worth in today's money, but the estimates are usually around about $1.50, so their loan was essentially for $60 million. The Britons never asked for a loan in the first place. In fact, the Celtic tribal people were rich in resources like gold. But they accepted the money anyway because it was the only way that they could have a currency to buy and sell with the Romans. Nero took Claudius's place 
place as the new emperor of Rome in the year 54. He was just 16 years old at the time, and he was known for his extravagant spending. In turn, he sought to regain much of the lost funds by going after interest on loans as well as through taxes. Nero appointed a man named Suetonius Paulinus to handle the new territory that was England. He was given the position of governor of Great Britain, and he was also the general of the Roman army. In the year 60, King Prastigus, he died, and Queen Boudicca became the new leader of the Iceni tribe. Of course, the Romans did not see Boudicca as a legitimate leader because she was a woman. As we mentioned earlier, there were certain contracts in place before King Prastigus's death that should have guaranteed his people's safety. But General Paulinus, he decided to ignore all of this and take the Iceni by force. He used the loan as an excuse, and he demanded that he wanted all 40 million sesterces to be paid back in full, plus interest. And he needed it all back immediately. The Romans went into every single home, taking anything of value that they could find. They captured men as slaves, and they raped the young women. Not even the young princesses were spared. Boudicca's daughters were sexually assaulted by Roman soldiers. When she tried to rescue her daughters, the soldiers grabbed the queen, ripped her clothes off, and beat her bloody in front of her people. Since King Prastigus truly did leave that land to the Romans, the Celts could only stand and watch as their beloved queen was brutalized in front of them. Boudicca had been beaten. But she was not broken. Instead of withering in self pity, this attack it only sparked her need for revenge. Boudicca called a meeting with the leaders of the local tribes and learned that they had all been treated in the same way. Everyone was furious at what the Romans had done. The leaders of several Celtic tribes they all agreed to put aside their differences and follow her as their new queen. It was clear that if the Celts wanted their freedom, they were going to have to fight for it. Boudicca had witnessed her husband's defeat against the Romans years earlier, and yet she was not afraid to fight them once again for her people's freedom. Armed with a sword and her horse-drawn chariot, Boudicca stood in front of her Celtic warriors. Just like her men, her face would have been adorned in battle paint. Women were fighting alongside men, and each and every one of them had the fire of vengeance in their hearts. The Celts began the rebellion by targeting the Roman city of Camulodunum, which is modern-day Colchester. She waited until General Paulinus was out of town, and he took his troops with him. He was on a campaign to capture Anglesey, which is an island in Wales. Since he took all of his soldiers with him, he left Camulodunum virtually undefended. Once he was gone, Boudicca and her men they entered the city, and they slaughtered all of the Roman men that they could find. When Roman leadership got word that they needed help defending the city from a tribal queen who was leading a rebellion, they grossly underestimated her. So since she was a woman. They sent a measly 200 unarmed slaves to take care of the issue. Obviously, this handful of men were nothing compared to her massive army of 120,000 people. An additional 2,500 Roman soldiers were sent to help defend the city. For several days, the soldiers tried to keep civilians alive by hoarding themselves in the Temple of Claudius. The Celts grew tired of waiting, and they set fire to the temple, which trapped and killed everyone inside. When General Paulinus returned to the city, he found the temple crumbling in a pile of ash, as well as the gruesome scene of beheaded men, dissected bodies, and pools of blood. He knew that his small legion of 5,000 men would be no match for Boudicca, so he had no choice but to ride ahead to each major Roman stronghold and try to evacuate civilian refugees before it was too late. Historian Cassius Dio wrote, All this ruin was brought upon the Romans by a woman, a fact which in itself caused them the greatest shame. Next, the Celts moved on to Londinium, which is, as you would imagine, modern-day London. They burned the entire city to the ground. While in London, tribal men who had been enslaved by the Romans they were set free, and they began to follow Boudicca. Her army temporarily grew to over 230,000 troops. They sacked the city of Verulamium, which is modern-day St. Albans. It is estimated that Boudicca's army killed and tortured between 70,000 to 80,000 Roman people. In the Roman history books, they describe the Celtic slaughter as being truly barbaric. Some modern-day historians believe that this imagery was exaggerated in order to demonize the Celtic culture. Just like every other colonizing nation, the Romans believed that they were the more civilized ones, even though they started the fight by attacking, robbing, and raping the Celtic people beforehand. Boudicca and the rest of the Celts were steadily making progress to regain the Britons' independence from the Roman Empire. At this point, Emperor Nero was seriously considering pulling his Roman troops out of Great Britain. If Boudicca kept up killing his people at such a rapid rate, she could topple the entire empire. And if she had succeeded at that, she would have gone down in history as the queen who united the Celtic tribes under a common cause and regained their independence. 
But unfortunately for her, General Paulinus was confident that he could win. He convinced Emperor Nero to stay because he was ready with a strategy that was going to take down the resistance once and for all. The final confrontation was known as the Battle of Watling Street. As the name suggests, the two armies met at a Roman road called Watling Street. While there is a map of this road, most historians disagree over the exact location because there is only a brief description of the location given by the historian Tacitus. General Paulinus chose this location because it was ideal for his defensive strategy. A forest protected the back of the Roman soldiers so they could not be attacked from behind. Further, there was an open field in front of the forest which forced Boudicca's army to charge straight towards them. As mentioned earlier, General Paulinus only had 5,000 soldiers in his army. He had to send a letter to all of the veterans living in Great Britain who were much older and enjoying their retirement. Luckily for him, an additional 5,000 men were still loyal to the Empire and he was able to assemble a total of 10,000 troops. Even after calling for backup, he was outnumbered by Boudicca's army. According to Roman historian Cassius Dio, Queen Boudicca spent time before the battle giving a long and riveting speech about fighting for freedom that rather sounds like it's straight out of a Hollywood movie. It reads, If you weigh well the strengths of our armies, you will see that in this battle we must conquer or die. This is a woman's resolve. As for the men, they may live or be slaves. I am not fighting for my kingdom and wealth now. I am fighting as an ordinary person for my lost freedom, my bruised body, and my outraged daughters. However, Cassius Dio wasn't even there to listen, and in fact there were very few witnesses who actually survived, therefore we can't be sure if the speech was actually like this at all. This is especially the case when we consider that she spends a lot of time trying to convince her troops that even though she's just a woman, they should still trust her anyway. If you really think about it, 100,000 Celts wouldn't really be there if they didn't trust her in the first place. Further, archaeological evidence suggests that Celts had given women positions of power in the military for hundreds of years before this, but we'll get to that later. The Celts they had plenty of weapons and plenty of supplies that they had scavenged from the various Roman cities that they had defeated. However, they were still not as well equipped as the Roman army. Roman soldiers they wore full suits of armor, helmets, and had sandals with nails at the bottom to help them from slipping in the grass. They also had swords and large shields. Their spears they could be thrown long distances, which helped them to avoid hand-to-hand -hand combat. Despite these setbacks, the Celtic people were so confident that they would win the battle that they even brought a wagon train with their wives and children. The wagons formed a semicircle around the back of the Celtic army, sealing off the exit. According to records, General Paulinus could see the fear in his men's eyes as they stared at this army that was ten times larger than their own. But he used insults to snap the fear out of his men. He tried to boost their morale by mocking the enemy. He said that the Celts were savages and pointed to the female warriors as evidence that they were weaker than the Romans. Just like he did with Boudicca, the historian Cassius Dio invented yet another long and grandiose speech for General Paulinus to say to his troops. While we might not know exactly what words were exchanged, we do know what the general's battle strategy was. He knew that even though his army had fewer men, that they had a great advantage with their technology. The Roman soldiers stood side to side and crouched together behind their shields. During the first rounds of battle, the Celts charged towards the Romans, who threw their spears into the air. Without heavy metal armor to protect them, the spears went through the chainmail and the bare chests of the Celtic warriors. Boudicca told the men to fall back before pressing on once more. When the Celts pushed up against this wall of Roman shields, the Romans would draw their swords and stab the men in the chests. Every few minutes, the Roman soldiers would rotate and the man who was just fighting was moved to the back of the line. This way, each man was fresh and ready for battle, and it gave everyone a chance to rest. After the Celts had exhausted thousands of their soldiers, General Paulinus gave the order for his men to push themselves together into a triangular formation. They then charged towards the Celtic army. This was a very powerful maneuver that pushed against the men, and it forced the Celtic people to retreat. Cassius Dio wrote, The remainder took to flight, although escape was difficult, as the cordon of wagons had blocked the outlets. The troops gave no quarter, even to the women. The baggage animals themselves had been speared and added to the pile of bodies. According to Roman records, 80,000 Celtic men, women, and children were killed during the Battle of Watling Street, and just 400 Roman soldiers died at the hands of Boudicca's army. After losing the battle, records say that Boudicca managed to run. While we do not know what happened next, Tacitus speculated that she would have poisoned herself because it would have been the honorable thing to do at the time. However, Cassius Dio wrote that she had later died of an illness. Ultimately, we do not know when or how Boudicca died. 
For years, her story was all but forgotten. This was an embarrassing stain in the Roman Empire's history, so it only made sense that it was buried for quite some time. But during the Renaissance, the story of the Celtic Queen's bravery it began to emerge once again. She was remembered, and she was painted by artists, and during the Victorian era, statues were created in her honor. It didn't take long before she became a British icon. Despite the detailed Roman records, some people began to wonder if she even existed at all and considered the possibility that this warrior queen may have actually just been a legend. In fact, even the name Boudicca comes from the Celtic word meaning victorious. At the very least, there is a chance that Boudicca may not have been her real name and it was just a placeholder put in place of her true identity. It was in the Victorian era that Boudicca's fame finally took on legendary proportions as Queen Victoria came to be seen as Boudicca's namesake, their names being identical in meaning. Victoria's poet laureate Alfred Lord Tennyson wrote a poem Boadicea, and several ships were named after her. In 2001, archaeologists uncovered a burial site of a Celtic female warrior who was laid to rest with a huge amount of respect. At her feet were small treasures, including a mirror, a brooch, and blue glass beads. Her chariot it was decorated with red coral gathered from the sea. Two other soldiers were buried next to this woman and her chariot. These are known as the Wetwang Graves, and all of the artifacts from the archaeological site they are now kept at the British Museum. According to Tony Spence, who works at the Department of Prehistory in Europe for the British Museum, they believe that this woman was a queen because of the special care and respect that was given to her remains. Her chariots and the other objects surrounding her were also so expensive only royalty could afford such an extravagant burial. She would have been in her late 30s to early 40s, and she was very tall. They were also able to use her skull to do a facial reconstruction of what she would have looked like. Her face was disfigured, so it's easy to see how she could be described as frightening, just like how Cassius Dio described Boudicca. Despite the fact that nearly every detail seems to line up with the story of Boudicca, carbon dating done by Oxford University in 2017 placed these artifacts anywhere between the years of 145 to 200 BC, which would have been about two to three hundred years before Boudicca's battle took place. But scientists are now saying that carbon dating has the potential to be wrong. In 2018, Cornell University did an experiment which showed proof of carbon dating that was offset by several hundred years. This means that many of the historical timelines we've been taught about ancient civilizations could actually be rather wrong. Without a written record, or until we invent a time machine, we may never know the full story behind the true identities of these people in those graves. And indeed, it will probably remain an unsolved mystery forever. But whether the Wetwang grave belongs to Boudicca or not, it still proves undoubtedly that the Celts included warrior women in battle. And if they were really 200 years before Boudicca's time, it only goes to show that in ancient Britain, women were respected enough to lead armies for several generations. The remains of this warrior queen may sit in plastic bags and cardboard boxes in a museum, but the spirit of these leaders are still very much alive in the hearts of everyone who stands up against their oppressors. Even if she was on the losing side of the war, Boudicca truly was a hero. So I really hope you found that video interesting and inspiring. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. And don't forget to subscribe. We've got brand new videos just like this several days a week. If you hit that bell button as well, you'll find out about when we put these videos out. So why not do that? Give it a like, all of that good stuff. And as always, I'll see you next time.